Yes. And this time we are going to talk about gardening. And today's session is what I call a question and answer session. All it's right. the questions that I have gotten from home gardeners regarding their gardens. I've just come from a class right now. Or we were talking about selecting irresistible vines for your landscape. It's mm. a great topic. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know. But during the class, some people gave me some questions they had related to their gardens. Mm -hmm. One of those questions was somebody who had some tomato plants that they were growing mm -hmm. and they had mm -hmm. powdery mildew. Ooh. They didn't know what it was. They just saw this white fuzzy stuff yes, on top yes. of the leaves and also underneath the leaves. And of course, also on their parsley. Mm. And so I explained to her that was powdery mildew. And powdery mildew is one of the three major diseases you get on your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. first two is early blight and late blight. Those ones start on the lower bottom of their tomatoes. And they, they are brown blotches. You know, they start uh, messing up with the leaves from the bottom. Yes. So they progress up and it kills the leaves and they are all dried out and they fall down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Powdery mildew, on the other hand, if we have cool nights and humid, cool and humid nights, and warm and probably uh, humid days, so cool and wet nights and warm and humid days, you tend to see a lot of powdery mildew. That's right, yeah. The next day. So, and of course, if they're growing in a place where they're a bit, it's too cool, like, of course, cool like school, even though you're in the summer, so sometimes you find powdery mildew. So one mm -hmm. of the things you do is if the leaves have been infected mostly, you can prune off those leaves that are infected. Those are ah, looking yes. fuzzy. And for those of who are listening, I'll show you those pictures on my website, which is the homegardeningsupportnetwork.com. But you remove those leaves that are infected, prune them off, and of course don't reuse the same pruner mm -hmm. uh, to the next plant. When you go to the next plant, you need to dip it in 10% alcohol. So that you sterilize right. your, so that you don't move the fungus from one infected plant to a healthy plant. So that is the first thing. The second thing is if you have to use uh, chemicals, a fungicide, you can use an organic one like sulfur mm. or copper fungicide or even a product with neem oil. Yes. yes. So those three will help in controlling your powdery mildew. So you may see powdery mildew, it affects other plants. If you have onions, you may also see it on onions. Of course, it is the terrible, terrible disease of a lot of the cucumber family. So if you're growing any cucumbers, any squash, any pumpkins, around now in the summer, you may start seeing that blotchiness, the white powdery stuff. Yeah. That's the same treatment you do. So that was the first question that I got. Amazing. The Amazing. second question wow. that I got was somebody who had mealy bags, bags on their plants, and they were asking, how, you know, how do they look? If you looked at a mealy bag, mealy bags like to congregate at the junctions yeah. of the plant, at the tips. Of course, if you have like flower buds, I had somebody who had roses, and on the bud itself, there was a lot of mealy bags. I had somebody who had citrus, and on the branches, at the junction of the branches, there was a lot of mealy bags. They're whitish stuff but if you looked at a mealy bug it has like almost like little filaments it's a flat little insect mm -hmm. but what they do is they accumulate this whitish powdery stuff which is sticky yeah they surround themselves with it because they try to protect themselves from other insects or predators and so you find this mess or mass of mealy bugs a lot of them congregating around the tips of the plant on the junctions that's what happens so one of the best thing to do first again is you prune off the ones that are heavily infested. Sometimes there's no need of trying to treat a plant that has got a heavy infestation of mealybugs. You need to mm -hmm. just prune off those branches and put them in a plastic bag. Don't take them to the landfill. I mean, don't take them to your compost bin. Put them in a plastic bag and probably take them out where they, they pick them up to take them to the landfill. Hopefully mm -hmm. when they do the, the burning or composting, they'll kill them. But... Um, when you prune it off, the second thing is you can take a water hose and wash off your plants if mm -hmm. you are in a position to do so. It again lowers the infestation level. The third thing is again you can use either insecticide or soaps or horticultural oil or neem oil, mm. especially if they are vegetable plants that you, you're using or fruit trees. But if you're using, if they are happening, the mealybugs are in your shrubs like on your hibiscus or any of the landscape plants, plants that you're not eating, you can take an, a systemic insecticide like one called Merit. 
So you can take this and put it around the root system and it's taken up the plant systemically. That's why it's called a systemic insecticide. Mm -hmm. And you can, it's gonna go to the branches of the plant and hopefully spread throughout the plant. And then when those insects come in to do their sucking and evil work, then they are able to ingest it and they die. So mm. they, the systemic insecticide stays longer. It's longer in the plant, much more than uh, contact insecticide. For instance, if you're using neem, within a few days, neem will, within a few hours, let's say two days, it's dissipated, it's mm -hmm. finished. It doesn't stay long. So when you're using organic or sustainable alternatives in controlling your pests, the alternatives you have like insecticidal soap or neem oil or horticultural oil, they don't stay long. And that's a good, that's a good thing because mm -hmm. they don't affect the beneficial insects. They are better for the environment. But if you're using something stronger, like a systemic insecticide, which is a drench, you're applying it at the root system, it's being taken up by the plant, and then of course it's being spread throughout so mm -hmm. that it takes care of those bugs. So that kind of insecticide might stay longer. It may stay maybe three weeks, a month or so. So you read the instructions. Every one of those mm -hmm. pesticides, they come with an ins instruction, little manual on the back of the bottle that you bought them with, yeah? I only gave an exception to when you can use a systemic insecticide. If you're having flowering plants, let's say mm -hmm. you have hibiscus, let's say you have, let's say, um, like there's a, a nice plant that I like, it's called red lea. It's a mm -hmm. shrub you find in yeah. the landscape. If you have croton, you have the snow bush, you know, those plants that you don't eat. You'll find a plumeria with aphids, millibugs, white yes. flies, spider mites, and everybody in between. It's like they're having a party on yeah, the plumeria right. plant. So you need to be able to control it. And, 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 and because most of them are growing tall, you may not reach it with water or pruning or all that kind of thing. But if you do a systemic, and yeah. in fact, in some landscape companies, they do an injection. It's an injection. Oh, they wow. inject into the trunk these systemic insecticides so that it's taken up systemically through the plant so that it's controlled. So yeah. the, se the third question I got this week was from somebody who was trying to climb on their papaya tree to harvest the papaya. Oh. Of course, they realized very quickly they can't do that because it's going to fall with them on top. And so, of course, he was like, I don't know, I have all these papayas. It was a very tall yeah. papaya tree. It had beautiful looking papayas, but it was like, oh my goodness, almost 15 to 20 feet high. Yeah. So, you know, papayas can grow that high. One, I told them you can use a papaya picker, you know, the one with the long pole. That's right, yeah. And there are so many of them nowadays in the marketplace. They even have those with levers. You know, you can pull it up, you can extend it. Some of them you can construct yourself. It's like a big stick with a mm -hmm. big wire thing. Yeah. At the bottom, you tie it up with string. You create your own picker. You put it up there. It's like a hand. And of course, it will go to the papaya and turn it a little bit and it gets onto the yeah. thing. That's right. So you're able to harvest. That's one. Two. After the papayas are done, one of the things we do is what we call ratooning. And ratooning is where you cut down the papaya up to about three to five feet and you reduce the height. And what happens when you cut this tall papaya tree, mm -hmm. it gets new branches. So yeah. you select three of those branches. Those are lower at five feet. Now you're fine. Mm -hmm. So those new branches become your bearing new branches. It's called ratooning. Yeah. It's a process of lowering the height of a tall papaya. Of course, if you have the option, you buy dwarf papayas. You don't buy those tall ones. But if you happen to have those tall ones, that's a solution that you can use. Okay. All right. Now, the last question that I got was about uh, a loan how to take care of your lawn. And we have talked about lawns before, yes, right. yeah? Yes, we have. Especially in the summertime, if you have tough grasses, depending on the type of tough grass that you have. If you have s warm season grasses, things like zoetia grass or seashell paspalum or Bermuda grass mm -hmm. or centipede grass, all of those grasses uh, versus if you have cool season grasses, you know, people who live in cooler areas or mainland or temperate lands, you know, you have maybe fescue or perennial rye, any of those grasses that you can use for, for tropical climate. Let me address that first. If mm -hmm. you have zoetia grass, one of the things you need, of course, is to think about mowing, how often you mow. That's right. Of course, most of the time you mow like once a week. You yeah. know, or every, if at the very most, maybe more, not more than, of course, two weeks, because then the grass grows too big. Uh, so the mowing frequency, and then two, the watering frequency. Mm -hmm. We say for lawns, you water early in the morning, 
before eight if it's possible so that the grass is dry during the day and water deeply and infrequently if you can. Three is fertilizing. Most of the lawns, they like being fertilized at least once a month, if you can. Mm. We say at least one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So you work mm. out how much that is in terms of your actual fertilizer, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you have a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, it means one bag of a 100 pound fertilizer has 10 pounds of nitrogen. If it's a 10, mm -hmm. 10, 10, because that's by percentage. I hope I don't give you a headache trying to think it through. <laughs> All right, so let's start again. You have a bag of 10, 10, 10. It's a 100 pound bag of fertilizer. It means that 10 pounds of that fertilizer is nitrogen. All right, okay. I gave a recommendation of one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So you got to figure how much of the actual fertilizer do I need? Mm -hmm. You need 10 pounds, yeah? Okay. 10 pounds of that 10, 10, 10, Fertilizer is going to give you one pound of nitrogen, and that's what you need per thousand square feet. So find out how big your land is. You do an extrapolation. Mm -hmm. So if your land is 10 feet wide by 20 feet long, that's 10 by 20 is 200 square feet. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you need one pound per thousand square feet, so you divide that and you get how much you need. Yeah. So fertilizing is key. The last thing I want to talk about is probably uh, doing dethurching, and we've spoken about dethurching mm -hmm. and co-aeration at least once or twice a year. If you can do it at least once a year, because the zoetia grass and cisoperspelum grasses, they do clump. They have mm, a way of clumping, yeah. and then they get what you call that thick, big uh, thatch, yeah. thatch layer. Yeah. If your thatch layer is more than half an inch, then you need to do dethurching, which is taking this machine that goes through your grass. You can rent it in one of the places like Lowe's. They rent it out or walk okay. Home Depot. You can rent the machine, actually. And it just goes through the grass. It's like tearing the grass. It's opening it up. That's dethurching. And then you do the core aeration, which is another machine which poke holes through ah, your grass and pulls up yes. plugs, which enables the soil to be, if it was compacted, it has air now going through. And you follow those two processes, dethurching and coeration, with a fertilizer and a compost and water. So if you do that once a year in the spring, if you're in the tropics, or maybe mm -hmm. in the fall, if you're in the temperate lands, your grass is going to thank you, and it will look good. So those mm -hmm. were the questions for the week that I had. And of course, oh, I remember one more, last one. That's Somebody had this plant on their papaya plant, the same guy who was trying to climb that papaya tree. <laughs> but <laughs> of course, they would never do that. But uh, they were wondering if it had a disease. But when I looked at the papaya itself, it, it was a male papaya. Okay. You know, papayas are polygamous, if you didn't know that, yeah? They are polygamous, meaning a papaya plant has three types of flowers. It has a female flower, a male flower, and one we call a hermaphrodite. It has a combined hermaphrodite. We want papayas with a hermaphrodite flower because those ones are self-pollinating. You get more fruits from them. And if you don't get more of the hermaphrodite, then you get at least one with a female flower. You'll tell it because mm -hmm. if you looked at the flower, you'll see the stigma. And of course, one with a male and female, it has a stigma and an anther. If you remember your biology from school those days. But if you look at it clearly, it's, it does show. One which is male, it has this big pentacle where the flower would have been stuck on the trunk. Mm -hmm. Most papaya flowers are stuck on the trunk. But this a male papaya plant has these long pentacles. We call them pentacles. So the flowers are actually hanging in a long mm -hmm. tubule, yeah. like a thing. You can see the flowers hanging out. When you see anything like that, just cut it down. It's a male flower, <laughs> papaya, down because it's not going to give you fruits. It's just yeah. going to be there taking space for nothing. That's right. So sometimes you find an avocado plant which opens, maybe one variety opens in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the male part of that avocado doesn't open until afternoon. So there is no pollination. And that's why you need another avocado which has flowers opening of the male in the morning. Mm -hmm. So if they open at the same time, then the bees can do the pollination. Okay. So you need two All types right. of plants. So, yeah. of course, in nature, if you understand the anatomy of some of the plants you're growing, avocados are one of those. Apples, of course, are also, the, you know, you hear people planting apples that are just pollinator, mm -hmm. a pollinator, just 
its role is to provide the pollen for the other apple trees so that they can get the fruits anyway so that those are three tips or four or five tips that we had this week it was question and answer Amazing. session and we hope they've been helpful for you absolutely we are trying to help the landscapers and farmers out sure. there to be able to market their gardening programs Amazing. the homegardeningsupportnetwork.com 